Hey there, this is Vlad from the Insurance Sales Lab, and welcome to the Insurance Sales Lab podcast. Today, my guest is no other than Craig Wiggins. Uh, Craig, welcome to the show. Appreciate the invite, man. Glad to be here. Yeah, I think a lot of people who are going to be watching this are going to be totally confused why the two of us <laughs> you have a, a training a company that works with insurance agents. I do the same. Like, why in the world would we two have a conversation? I think um, for me, I always want to learn from people who know something I don't know. And I can learn from, from everyone. And obviously, you've achieved some, some uh, success that less than 0.01% of agents in the country have ever achieved. So what I'd like to do today is pick your brain on how you went from zero customers uh, a few decades ago, no book of business, and you grew your agency to now you're at what, 40 million as a book mm -hmm. of business? Yeah, Great. we booked the 40 million. 40 million. Cool. We can talk about a thousand different things. Today, I want to focus on how you structure your team, uh, how you segment them, what targets they have, how you manage the, the business side of things. And uh, if, if you've removed yourself and you've put people in position, I'd like to ask about that as well. But before we do that, uh, has 40 million always been the goal when you got into the industry to be one of the biggest agents in the country? How did that all happen? Man, the goal was just to survive in the beginning. You know, I, I started from scratch um, in 96 and it was a tough time to get started. Our, our company, um, Hurricane Andrew, had just come through Florida a couple years before. So the guidelines and the rates were extremely restrictive. If someone had one ticket, one accident, or one claim in the past five years, we couldn't write them. So it was a really tough time. And I remember the, the, the idea was, or the plan, the state plan in Alabama was 1.9 cars a month and 0.9 homes a month. That's what they expected out of me. Wow. Uh, agents at that time as a scratch agent. So it was tough. I just, I had to sell a lot of life insurance, I had to sell commercial. And frankly, every single person I went through training with, they were gone within 18 months and, and, and I was the only one left. So it was, it was tough. So that said, the goals back then were just like, Hey, let's just make it to the, let's make it to the next month. Um, and, and then obviously they changed over time as, as things got better and that type of thing. But no, that was not the goal originally for sure. Yeah. It w was there a moment in your career where something clicked or you had epiphany or something occurred in your agency where you felt like, okay, I don't have it all figured out, but I think if I lean into this idea that I'll be able to grow this thing to what it is right now. Was, was there a moment like that? If so, what was that moment? Yeah, I think, you know, a couple of years in, um, when I started working with new home buyers, right? You got to remember the guidelines and everything. Um, when I worked with the new home buyer, they didn't have any claims history and they had pretty good credit or they couldn't be buying a house. So they fit our, our underwriting model. Okay. And then I started working with the mortgage officers and the processors that were working with those new home buyers. And all of a sudden things just started to click with me that, hey, this may be the way to not only grow the business, but, you know, lead generation, it, using the, the loan officers and centers of influence to, to, to get the leads. That was a home run at that time. And of course, you got to remember back then, that was you know, almost 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. There weren't a lot of internet leads. There weren't all these warm transfers. It, it, direct mail was kind of a thing, but it was mainly, you know, relationships and that type of thing. So that's what I ran with. And I, and I, I probably went to about probably 10 million strictly off that process. You know, what, what can we do to work with loan officers and processors to drive business? And, and, um, and that was probably the initial success that I had that kind of, you know, built everything going forward. Zero to 10 million. How much time did that take? Um, that was probably about eight or nine years, something like that. And then 10 to 20. How, how much time did that take? Cause that's a different growth plan at that point because. Yeah. Um, 10 to 20. I'm going to say probably another four or five years to get there. And there were some acquisitions once, you know, I got to 10 without any acquisition, or maybe there's one or two small ones in there. But then once I started getting scale, I realized, you know, hey, the, the way to really blow this up was to buy more agencies. So, you know, the later acquisitions that that really fueled the growth. And, you know, that's how you can that's how you can go from 20 to 40 in just a few years. Got it. So as you make those acquisitions, your team grows, uh, 
you're at how many team members right now? Did I get this right? 31? Yeah, 31 total now. 31 total. How do you segment your team and how do you manage a $40 million book with 31 team members? Well, you know, and I think for, for people watching this, you know, if you're, if you're not that size now, what we do today may not be that important for you. But, you know, what my, my goal, my vision for this through the years has always been to continue specializing, right? So a lot of agents, they have people that do everything. They're hybrid models, they service, they sell. Once we broke off and started having people do the sales and other people do the service, you know, that was the first big step. But then from there, every time somebody's doing work that is below their pay grade, like if I'm, I'm paying you, your producer, and let's just say you're, you're, you're making $35 an hour when everything's you know, considered. If you're over there doing a lot of work, that's $12 an hour work. And there's enough of that work for me to go hire somebody. Then I need to go hire somebody to do that work. Right. So I create another. That's right. And just and keep specializing as we go forward. So, you know, sales assistants, admin assistants, people specialize in inspections, running cancellation audits. So you, you constantly develop those roles. And then as you build that team and get bigger and bigger, now you need some leadership positions. You know, you need some people that can manage and develop those people. So, you, you know, a service manager, a sales manager, operations manager, you know, and then you're, you're just constantly delegating work and trying to duplicate yourself within that model. And I think if you have that vision going forward, if you're watching this now and you're say three or $4 million, how do I get there? You know, acquisitions can be part of it, but, a, but the bigger part to really grow beyond that place where most people hit the wall and kind of stop is duplicating yourself, you know, delegating work. If you have somebody, and I like this number, 70%, if they, if, if I can, if I can bring you aboard and you can do the job 70% as good as I can do it, then I need to hire you to do that work. I'd rather have three or four people doing it at 70% than me doing it all at hundred percent, because then now I can go do other things. And then that, that process just continues to evolve. So even with your salespeople, you know, now we've got salespeople here that they, they crush it every month that they've got to qualify, but once they qualify, then they get a sales assistant and that sales assistant will help them with the things that are well below their pay grade. So it frees them up to do other things. So, you know, as you're thinking about your model and what you want it to look like for the future and the growth of your business, think about who can you, who can you duplicate? What can you delegate? What positions can be created? You know, a good thing to do is draw out an organizational chart, you know, if yourself at the top and what you would like it to look like five years from now, if it was the ideal model, what would you want that to look like? And then step back and look at it and say, which one, what position is the most pressing? Well, let's go higher and fill that role, you know, and, and let's, Let's keep doing that as much as we can to move this forward. And I think if people truly subscribe to that and make that a part of, of what they're doing, growth will come a lot easier. You do have to take some chances because sometimes people, you know, they don't, they don't pay for themselves right away. So there's some investment there, but um, that's worked extremely well for us um, through the years. And, and we continue to do that today. That one idea of drawing up a five-year approach an organizational chart of where you'd like to be five years from now has just paid the price of admission. I think <laughs> I, I, for anyone who just heard that but didn't internalize that, this is a good opportunity after the, listening to this conversation to just sit down with your business partner or uh, by yourself. And it's always best to start, at least for me, to start by yourself and then run it off of someone, run it off your team. And say what would it look like like how cool would it be if if it wasn't just the three of us here but it was 13 of us and we had a sales team of five people a service team of four people each has a sales manager or a, a service manager like how cool would that be what can we do today to get to that next level so just by thinking about that uh over time you know, you can't just think something and it'll become a reality, but it's hard to have to become a reality if you don't first think about it. So Absolutely. And what's interesting is I, I actually was in my home office about, I don't know, a year ago. And I found that document. I actually did that process years ago, right? I drew out what I wanted my staff to look like. And I drew out what I wanted my floor plan of my building to look like. Wow. And it wasn't exact, but it was really cool how close it actually was. Because I, I built this building about three years ago and um 
it was really close, you know, and, and some of the positions, you know, I didn't really think about some of the things that we have today, but yeah, you got to have that foresight. You got to have that vision of, you know, let's keep pushing this forward. Most agencies, they get to that three, $4 million range and then they're stuck and they hit that wall and they can't get any bigger because what they were doing in the past to grow now doesn't work anymore and they can't replace what they're losing enough to grow. And it usually requires more people. It requires additional responsibilities, additional skill sets, or just duplicating and delegating that work. So, yeah, I think that's a great exercise for anybody to, you know, to work through. Yeah, I do want to follow up on the question of, or the idea of if they can do 70% of, of what the job requires, then bring them on. And how do you balance that idea with, bringing on top talent, like A players, uh, because I'm sure that you can't, like in, in your experience, you've realized the major contrast between an A player versus a B player. An A player can write two or three times as much as a B player. So just cost-wise, it makes a lot more sense to do an A player. How do you balance those two ideas of someone who's coming in ready to rock versus someone who's at that 70% mark that needs to be coached up to be at 100 well, I think you do both. I mean, if you find, um, and I'll date myself, if you find that Michael Jordan, right, you figure out a way to get him on your team. Yeah. You, know, you find that person that you know is a home run, you figure out a way to get him on the team. But just, just from a, just a philosophical perspective, you know, if, if I can write, let's say I can write 150 items a month myself, right, and I'm killing myself to do that, but I have all these other things that I really should be doing. I should be hiring more people. I should be training, coaching, you know, working with centers of influence, all those things. If I can bring somebody in that can write 70% of that, even 50% of that, then I need to do that, right? And hire two or three people like that. And maybe a couple of those develop into rock stars. Everybody we have in this building that's crushing it now, none of them came in as a rock star. They were developed over time. And, and we, you know, they started at maybe 30, 40 policies a month, that kind of thing. And they've worked their way up. So I, I don't know if I would say there's a, you know, right or wrong way to do that or, hey, you got to focus on just it's all about any business you have, because I work with other businesses, too. It's all about duplication. If you can duplicate yourself, whatever role you're in now. OK, and this could be like years ago when I was doing hiring. Right. When I was actually involved in that process, I don't do that anymore. Now I have people that do that. So every step of the way, whatever you're doing today, if you can duplicate that yourself within that work by hiring another person, that's how you're gonna grow. No doubt about it. And it's that way for any business. Yeah, Elon Musk can't run three or now $4 billion companies by answering customer service calls. No, no, no. <laughs> um, he can't. He's the number one, he's the best recruiter I think today. He has employs the most intelligent people in the universe. Okay, so um, 31 team members, how many of them do sales as their specialty? Only seven of them. Seven. The rest are answering calls, or is there another layer of? <clears throat> There's a wide. You've got people that are doing customer service work. You got people that are doing <clears throat> admin work, inspections for homes, cancellation audits, um, claims activity. Then you have your leaders. You got your people that work with the service team, work with the sales team, um, the operations manager. You've got all these different positions that you know were created throughout that group. So. And that can constantly evolve and change as well, you know, as that business is growing. And what I'm always doing is like, you know, what is so-and-so working on? What are, what are their core responsibilities throughout the day? And if I'm not leveraging their talent and their ability and their pay rate for what they're doing, and if they're doing lesser work, we need to, we need to evaluate that and figure out, you know, is, are, is there a small enough amount of it where they can continue to do that? Or do I need to hire somebody else? and get them in there to free them up to do more, you know, of the higher level work. Got it. Um, so how do you, from a daily, weekly, monthly standpoint, check in with the team members uh, and make sure that they're performing at their peak level? How much of it is done by you now, or is it by the leadership team now that, that all of that is handled? No, that's, that's a good question. We, we do a sales meeting every Tuesday morning. Mm -hmm. We do a service meeting every Thursday morning. And we have multiple locations. So, you know, we do a lot of Zoom calls where they're involved in those meetings through Zoom. When we were shut down last year during, you know, the pandemic, we were shut down for a few months and everybody was at home working remotely. All those meetings were done, you know, via Zoom. 
So we're, we're checking them at the group, each group, the sales and service group once a week as a group. And the, the purpose of those meetings is not just to communicate, you know, where we stand or anything like that is to try to get them better. So you come into the meeting with an idea, something we need to communicate, something to work on, something to role play. And hopefully by the end of that meeting, everybody has developed and they're a little bit better than when they started. So that's done in a group setting. And then once a week, whether it's a sales manager or the service manager, they're meeting with somebody on their team, you know, one time per week, face-to-face, one-on-one to review a call, listen to what they're, you know, what they need to improve upon. And they do a little role playing with them. And that's, that's a one-on-one setting. So meeting with everybody as a group once a week, and then everybody individually once a week, you know, to go over whatever it is we need to work on development wise. Now, if there's issues with accountability, you know, activity levels, something along those lines, then that's obviously a different meeting and outside of that structure. But that's the structure we try to keep from week to week and day to day. Okay. If I'm a sales producer working with <clears throat> Craig Wiggins organization, what is expected of me on a weekly and monthly basis? Well, we look at it on a daily basis and as a bare minimum, two a day. You got to have two a day. Two items a day. <laughs> two sales a day. Two sales every day. Um, we call them items. Some companies refer to them as policies, units, whatever. We're looking for two every day. And if they and we use a pyramid of expectations. Um, so it's a document that we produce that you can envision a pyramid. At the very top is the production. So if you get two, you're not going to hear from anybody. You're okay. That's that's. We don't want that. It's not like hey, you know, we're good if if you're just doing two. But nobody's going to come in there and beat you up over doing two. It's forty a month. We can make that work as a contributor. Yep. If they don't have two items, then we're looking for 10 quotes. So they got to have 10 quotes for that day. If they got their 10 quotes, didn't get the two items, we got some coaching we need to do to try to coach them up and figure out what we can do to turn those quotes into items. If they don't have their quotes, they need to have at least 100 outbound phone calls. And if they got their 100 outbound phone calls and didn't get the quotes, then you know obviously we got some coaching to do there and, and try to teach them up on that as well. And if they didn't make the calls, then, you know, there's just an effort conversation that needs to take yeah. place. Because again, they're specialized. They don't, they're not doing anything else. They've got eight hours every day, you know, to, to do this work. So that's what we're looking for from a bare minimum perspective. Um, but most of them are going to do, you know, 60, 80. We've got a couple that are going to do over a hundred every month. Got one that does 200 a month pretty consistently. So it just depends on the person, but as long as they're in that range, all the economics of that makes sense. We can make that work. And hopefully they're developing, they're getting better and better as they go. And, you know, someone is riding 50 a month now, six months from now, maybe they're, you know, at 70 or 80 or maybe more, you know, so it, it just depends on the person. Yeah. I have agents that I talk to, I'm sure you experience this as well, that say, man, I have this great team member who I love, uh, great energy, customers absolutely love her or him. And I don't want to let him go, but they just aren't closing sales. They're on the phone all day. They're quoting people, they're having conversations, they're having great conversations. Uh, they do everything except for take them to the finish line. And I've role played with them, but you know, a lot of agents aren't, don't consider themselves to be great sales coaches. So I've done everything on my end, but this person is just not cutting it. When do you make a decision, Craig, and put your shoes and put yourself in the shoes of an agent who's at two to 3 million, not 40 million, who, where cash flow is, is an issue where like, if, if we don't hit our numbers, I'm not taking a paycheck as an agent. When do I make that decision to let that team member go? Or do I let them go? Yeah, I mean, and look, that's probably like the biggest pain point outside of maybe hiring or recruiting um, that agencies deal with is how do, how do we manage that? And I think that, number one, you got to bring people on the right way. So if I'm, if I'm recruiting you and we're in the interview process, I've got to be very clear about my standards and my expectations of what I'm looking for from an activity perspective, not just production, but activity every single day when you come aboard, because that's what I'm going to hold you accountable to when you start. Most agencies don't do that. When I first started, I would just push people in the deep end of the pool. And if they couldn't swim and they drown, I'd drag them out and go get somebody else. And I, and I blamed it on them when it was really my fault. I wasn't owning that process well enough to give them the opportunity to be successful. So now, you know, we're very clear. Here's what's required from an activity perspective. So I've got one that just hired, I just hired three weeks ago. He was a chef in a restaurant. Restaurant closes down for COVID. They bring everybody back. They won't come back to work because they're on unemployment. So the restaurant closes, now he's looking for work. He comes in, never done insurance in his life. 
we go over, look, his name is Cam. Cam, this is what you've got to do. This is the expectation. And from an activity perspective, and he does it. In his first week, he writes 22 items, I think. And this month he's on pace for 59 in his first full month. So go over that first. If you've done a good job with that and you've brought them on the right way and you've got some weekly goals and some accountability from the very beginning, it's going to make it so much easier as you go forward. Because what, what I did is I would bring them on you know, I'd, I'd hire you and like, Hey man, it's going to be awesome. He's got a great personality. He, he took my comp plan, my terrible comp plan. He actually took it. Yeah. And now I just got to make it work. You go home and tell your wife and all that. And then a month later, you've written like, you know, 11 items. Like, well, maybe next month will be better. You know, we'll just, we'll just keep working with, it. you know, we got to get him up to speed. And now six months goes by and you're writing 17 items a month. Right. That doesn't work. I mean, those economics just don't work. So it doesn't take 90 days to get somebody up to speed. You can bring them in under the right circumstances and explain, look, this is what's going to be required. This is what I'm looking from you. And if they don't execute on that, then there's really nothing to talk about. You know, they're, you're not firing them. You're just delivering the message because they didn't do what, what was expected. So I think you bring them on the right way. Now, let's say you go through all that. Mm -hmm. and you've had those conversations and you've talked about accountability, which we can talk about if you want to. And now it's, now you got to make a decision. Now it's like, look, are, are they doing enough to contribute for you to hit your goals where it makes sense or do you need to get rid of them? And some of it could be frankly, that they're going to impact your culture in a negative way. Sometimes, you know, the way you deal with staff and the way you don't deal with staff, not only is it, is it affecting you and that person, it's everybody else watching how you're handling that. Mm -hmm. And the last thing you want to do is, lo is lose respect amongst your team members because of the way you did not handle something. And now it's affecting your culture in a negative way. So sometimes you got to deal with those things. Everybody wants to be the beast, but few people want to do what the beast does. Sometimes you just got to make that call. So when someone's not working out, you know, and, and it, you're, it, there's no need to put a square peg into a round hole. Either they work out or they don't. Mm -hmm. And you have to make that call as to what's acceptable and what's, what's you know, sufficient to maintain that person in that role. For us here, it's 40 a month. If they can do 40 a month, I can make those numbers work. If they can't at least do that, and maybe your number's lower than that. Maybe it's 25, maybe it's 20. But you need some numbers when they come in that they know they have to do. Not just production, but also activity. And they need to have weekly goals, especially that first month. When Cam came on, he knew his first week. He's got to do 10 his first week or he's not going to be here. He knows that coming in. Okay. So if he, if I show up, if let's say he starts on Monday and Friday he has three items and there's no progression and his attitude's not, I'm not going to keep that guy's just not going to make it. And now we're done. So I've wasted a week, one week of payroll, one week of training, one week of time. Okay. That's part of the risk. That's a lot better than six months. Right. And ideally what would happen is when we went over those expectations with him back in the interview and there was any red flags, any pushback on the number of calls, number of quotes, whatever it may be, then we fire him during the interview mm -hmm. and we never even made it to week one, right? So I think if you constantly evaluate your hiring process, your onboarding and the way you hold people accountable, as well as your role, meaning that you better be providing these people the support and resources and training that they need in order to be successful. You can't just tell them, go do this and everything's going to be fine, especially if they're new to insurance. You got to help with that. So sometimes you got to look in the mirror too, you know, and do some self-reflection. Are you doing what you need to do to get these people up to speed? If all those things are working well and it's still not happening, you know, you just, just made a bad hire, you know, and you move on. And it's just, it's just part of the process. That's what I want to dig into a little more where if, Maybe I didn't recruit them correctly. I didn't set the right expectations. But over time, I verbally stated what I want, then I put it on paper, then I put it on the wall. And now we're tracking on a daily, weekly basis where they know they need to do two a day or 10 quotes if they don't do that 100 calls. But I'm just not getting that of a team member. I've had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them. Do you want to be here? Yes, Craig, absolutely. This is my dream job. I'm going to do everything I can. They come in on time. They leave late. but they're just not cutting it. So you as the owner now are put in a position where if you don't do something about this, then the other producers are going to say, well, if Vlad got a pass, then I'll get a pass too. And then the other person starts lacking. And then before you know it, you have everybody producing less. So 
I think a lot of agents are, they know that they need to let someone go because they've had enough conversations with them. Values wise, they're good. Everything they do is compliant. They are good people. So they didn't break the law. They didn't break the company culture. They just, they, the numbers aren't there. And the activity isn't there, more importantly. Um, and you have to fire that person. Walk me through that conversation. How do you fire someone? Glad it's just not working out. I mean, that's it. it, it, it look, you know, and this is a very state to state kind of thing. You know, I have an employment law attorney that I've used for years that I make sure that I'm in compliance, regardless of which state I'm doing business in, that I handle that conversation correctly. For us here, if it's not working out, and, you know, in Alabama, you know, a um, uh, right to work state, you know, Vlad's just not working out. You know, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna let you go. And that's it. Because if I get into all the details, the more I get into, the bigger, the bigger hole I dig for myself, you know, what's that really? And see, here's the thing, the way we bring them on, they know, they, they know before, when, when we say, hey, we got it, they already know what it is. You know, they, they know what we got to talk about. Now, frankly, it doesn't happen as much now as it used to. Mm -hmm. because we're doing a better job of firing them during the interview mm -hmm. than we are week one, two, three, or 10. So, you know, I, I, what I would say to anybody watching this, you need to have an employment law attorney, somebody that, that reviews the way you handle HR in your agency. You know, you don't want to get in a situation where you get sued over something because you just didn't handle it the right way. Consult with somebody, pay them the money. You know, you need a good handbook. If you don't have a good handbook, pay the money for a good handbook. You know, you need, you need something that, is going to dictate how things are handled. Mm -hmm. And then you go to your attorney with any kind of questions you have and, and just make sure you're on the up and up. So, but we keep them very short and sweet. Yeah. Vlad, it's just not working out. And That's right. the, what I have found is do like the best time to do it is in the morning, first thing. And don't ask about their drive here, the weather, just sit down and lead with that. It goes straight to the point because the, to your point, the more long-winded it is, the worse the situation will be. And uh, if someone says, "Great, I respect your decision. I if you if I'm not a good fit, I'm not a good fit. But I promise you, I'll get better. Um, I've tried everything I could, but I I'll stay later or come earlier. Give me another shot. What, what's your what's your take on that? Is it a case by case scenario, or if, if you made the decision, you made a decision? It, it, it's, you know, it's a judgment call before, but once you've made that decision, look, the last thing you want to do is fire somebody and then rehire them on the spot. I mean, I don't like to rehire anybody, but I'm not rehiring them on, because think about what, what that, that message is sending to your whole team. Yeah. As a wishy-washy leader, they can't make a decision. Don't do that. You're better off to just cut them loose. And maybe you made a, mis a mistake with the firing, but you didn't make a, make a mistake with everybody else on your team. And sometimes I think owners, they lose sight of that. And the, the, look, your culture trumps everything. If your culture is poor, I don't care what kind of processes you put in place or what, what you do with sales training, you're going to have a tough time. If I have good culture, we can do a lot with that group. We can do a lot with those people because they do more. They go above and beyond. They're, they're not always looking for another job. They're not complaining. They're not looking for shortcuts. So, you know, I think that has to trump it all. It's uh, always think about not in the short term, but in the long. And I'll give you an example. When I was around five million dollars in premium, I had a lady on my team who I knew was a cancer. And I thought, you know what, I'll just hire my way out of this person. I'll hire enough people. Well, after about six or seven hires, they all basically share her philosophy on everything. So one morning we're having a meeting. They're all kind of they have their arms folded, you know, looking at the ground. Nobody's paying any attention. They're all like upset at whatever. I don't even remember what it was I was trying to implement. But I'm like, does everybody here feel this way? Does everybody agree with what Angela just said? Because she made a comment. Nobody said anything. I said, you know what, guys? It's probably best we just part ways. I need all of you just get your stuff and get out. And I you fired fire all the whole team? Whole team. Whole team. And yeah. I sat there for a minute. Of course, I, was, I kind of had a bad temper back then. Maybe worse than today. And I remember thinking, you know what, um, I'm, maybe I should call my dad. My dad used to be an agent. I'm like, dad, you still got your license because I need a little help with these phones for a few weeks. But yeah, it was one of the best decisions I ever made because, mm -hmm. yes, in the short term, there was a little bit of pain. It was difficult. It was tough. But if you don't, if you don't take your culture serious, if you don't get rid of the cancer, 
man, it's really hard to build that epic team that you're looking for that accomplishes the things that you really want to accomplish. And most agencies that have, you know, really deep rooted problems, it probably is a result of things like that. And then, and that's just very hard to overcome. So to me, culture trumps it all. If I can, if I can work on the culture and I get the right people come in here and they buy in, we don't all have to be best friends. You don't have to do team building events every weekend or things like that. But if you respect one another and they listen and they're trying and they're implementing things and everybody's got their heart in the right place, you can do big things with that group. Yeah. I think employee retaliation is one of the things that agents, just business owners worry about. Like what if they do damage to the business because they know so much about so many of our clients uh, or leave a bad review. And that prevents, I think more than anything, agents from letting team members go. But uh, there, there's a right way and wrong way to let people go. If you just bring someone in and you said, I'm glad this isn't working out and you've never had a conversation about their performance, that's the wrong way to do it. There needs to be some, con not just conversations, but conversations on paper that they sign and they say, yes, I'm committing to do, doing this. I remember back in the day when I worked at Best Buy, we were required to have a uh, first a verbal warning, then a written, then a final. By the time you get to the fire, you're like, all right, these two sheets you already signed. Adios, amigo. It was the simplest way to let people go. And it was almost never an issue. So I think now, it goes back to standards and expectations. Yeah. You have, as the leader, as the owner, you got to set that, right? And then, you know, as you go forward, you're holding them accountable. So if I bring you in and the first week, you know, it's not working, you know, we're going to talk about your activity levels all the way through. It's not just like wait until Friday. Yeah. We're dealing with it day by day, you know, and what I would encourage you guys to do is when you look at accountability, find out what motivates that person. Everybody has some motivation within them. I think it's hard for you to motivate. They got to motivate themselves. So I, I would ask you during the interview, you know, what, what is it you want to do with your money? Like specifically, what do you want to accomplish, you know, with, with the money that you make here? And when I find that out, when I know what your financial why is, then we can build everything around that in terms of the total money necessary to make that happen. And then come up with a plan using our comp plan or average premium, what you'd have to do with activity levels to make that happen. And now that accountability conversation, instead of me banging my fist on the desk or talking about the agency, now it's about you. That's so if you want to buy a house or pay off credit cards, whatever. Now all those conversations going forward can be about what you want to accomplish, not necessarily what I want to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And it makes it easier for both sides. So I think that's a huge part of it is to have that dialogue as you go forward. And ultimately, if you can't get somebody to get motivated for themselves, their family, you know, you may just made a bad hire. And that happens from time to time. Yeah. And once they hit their why or their goal, they bought the house and paid off the debt. You have to have a conversation uh, again, even before that happens. This is an ongoing thing not just the time of hire. I have to ask you this, Craig, before we hit record, uh, we were talking about Nick Saban. I asked you the question because you're from Alabama. Uh, yes. You have your, your, uh, your helmets uh, from, <laughs> from the school. So what's, what, what is up with your obsession with Nick Saban? Because I share that same feeling towards him. Uh, I want to hear how, like, what you learned from him that you're implementing in your business and your, your yeah. organization. Look, I, you know, I'm a huge Alabama fan. I've, I've been a Bama fan my whole life. I've lived here. My, my son goes to school there. So I'm definitely a, a fan of, of the football team. But even if you're not a fan of Alabama, because I know a lot of people hate Alabama and they hate yeah, yeah. it all the freaking time. Um, or if you don't even like football, if you're in business, you can pay attention to what this guy is doing and learn a lot that you can apply to your own. For example, focusing on the process and not the result. So if you're trying to win an annual award, hit a certain amount of bonus, whatever that is on an annual basis, don't focus on the result. Don't focus on you know, the recognition. Focus, what do I need to do to get there? What's the process monthly, weekly, daily? Not just for, for production, but activity. Let's make sure we're good at all those things. Let's make sure we're good with the process itself That'll put us in the best position possible, you know, to have a positive outcome. And I've learned a lot of that from him um, and the way he just the way he develops people. Um, there, there's so many lessons that can be learned from what he's done through his career. And the results speak for themselves. I mean, what he's done in this day and age is just 
How many titles? Well, he has seven. Seven. You know, and and six of them, you know, they 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 came from Alabama. So yeah. in that short, I mean, every here's here's a stat that people don't maybe don't think about. He started 14 years ago. Every single class that he has recruited that signed with Alabama, if they stayed at least three years, they have a ring. They've got a championship oh, ring, I know that. a national championship. And some of them have more than one. I mean, and that's just that's just amazing. He's got more rings in the last you know 10 years than some schools have had in their entire history. So the results are there. And, and it's all just attention to detail, focus on the process, you know, trying to get people to be the best that they can be, buy into the system, all the same kinds of things that we're trying to do every day in our agency. You can learn that from him. And it goes for a lot of different people in business, you know, leadership positions. So I've learned a lot from him. It's, he's been a great mentor, you know, to take away lessons from, to apply to what we're doing here. Yeah, there's a great documentary on Nick Saban and Bill Belichick, his really good friend, who is a, a coach for the New England Patriots. And he's won se- uh, six titles. Uh, and Nick Saban has won seven. So they have this annual meeting every year where they come together and share ideas. And they did the documentary this last year. And it is just amazing. There's so many leadership principles that can be extracted. Even if you don't know anything about football, you don't know any of the players by watching their conversations and their attention to detail and how they develop their teams, you can apply that in the world of business. So it's something that I've watched a few times now and I absolutely love. It's one of my favorite documentaries of all time. And I would highly recommend it. I'll link it below this video. Um, Craig, I know you got to go. I wish we could stay on for a bit longer because I have a few burning questions for you, but uh, we'll do this again. Uh, sometime. Hey man, I appreciate the invite. You, you let me know. I'll come back anytime. I appreciate what you're doing. I'm, I'm all about, you know, helping people. So um, thanks for everything and, and good talking to you today. It, it was my pleasure. Thanks, Craig. Thank you for watching this video. If you are an insurance agent who wants to write 100, 200, 300 policies per month, then I'd like to show you how this script can help you do exactly that. This script is what I personally used to write over 150 policies month after month after month. And many insurance agents have implemented this sales script in their agency and now are also writing over 100 policies per month. If you want to see a live demonstration on how this script works in action, then go ahead and register for my free sales training webinar. I'll include a link right below this video register for that free webinar and you'll be able to see exactly how the script works and you'll be able to start implementing it in your agency right away. There's no theory in that sales training webinar. I'll actually show you the script and how it works. Go ahead and register for that webinar and I'll see you there. Take care.